Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the head coach of the Memphis Tigers football team, Justin Fuente. Last season, the University of Memphis Tigers clawed their way to a rare 10-win season on the gridiron, just the program's second 10-win season since 1938. The team won a share of the American Athletic Conference title and made their first bowl appearance since 2008, stopping BYU 55-48 in the Miami Beach Bowl. This year, Memphis head coach Justin Puente enters his fourth season at the helm and has quickly become a hot name in the coaching circles. The future looks amazingly bright for Puente, and Tiger fans are hoping that his future means many more years leading the blue and gray. But first things first, and that's the present. How do the Tigers follow up their magnificent 2014 campaign with a 2015 season that will be remembered just as fondly. Today, the Tigers head honcho joins me to take a look at the upcoming season and a glimpse back at a 2014 campaign that resurrected the Tigers pigskin program. Justin Fuente is next on Sports Files. Justin, thanks again for joining us. You bet. Thanks for having me. Another season. We're looking forward to starting tonight against Missouri State. Let me ask you, first of all, how satisfied were you with your team's performance in camp and throughout summer off-season workouts? We had a good summer, uh, both in the classroom and in terms of uh, our workouts, our lifting and running. I think uh, Work Coach Lowe, our head strength and conditioning coordinator, did a fantastic job. Our kids did a great job responding to his teaching. Uh, in camp, we made some big strides, and we have some new faces. And uh, there was good give and take on both sides of the ball, which as the head coach, you like to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I like the way our kids push through. We hit the wall in camp, as every team does. Uh, our kids tried to battle through it, and uh, now we're ready to play. Yeah, I was going to say, not that you have a choice. You're ready to go tonight, right? Yeah, better be. Uh, it's here. So uh, we're excited. Our kids are excited. Um, you know, we're going to be a work in progress. We'll see how it goes today, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll walk away from this game with other things that we need to work on, and then we'll walk away from the second game with things we need to work on. So uh, we'll, we'll hopefully continue to improve and evolve through the season, and hopefully we can find a way to win a game or two. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing that you're no longer a surprise? Well, I think there's good and bad in everything. Um, you know, there's good that our kids, I believe, understand the workload and the dedication level that it takes to give yourself a chance to succeed. They have some confidence. When I say confidence, I mean they have confidence in the process, mm -hmm. confidence in the work, confidence in the things that they've done. The thing you've got to guard against, obviously, is complacency right. or lack of having an edge or a chip on your shoulder to continue to drive, to get to you to the plate, you know, the things that got you to that place to begin with. So. Uh, there are no secrets. Uh, you know, everybody knows we had success last year. I think people uh, will do a good job preparing for us. But I think they did a good job preparing for us last year, too. So um, there's, there's kind of, as with everything, there's a little good and a little bad in everything. Exactly. What do you think this, a season like last year did for the program overall? Well, I know it was huge in recruiting. Um, you know, hopefully it'll kind of be seen as the springboard into our facilities projects. Uh, you know, I think it got the attention of this, the city and the community. Hopefully, we continue to grow our support here in town uh, for our product. I think it justified or gave credence to the way that we do things with our kids. You know, the, the way that we go through off-season, the way that we practice, the way that we try and do things. I think maybe it, it validated it for them uh, that those things do work 
and that if you trust the process, you will give yourself a, a chance to succeed. I would imagine it's safe to say you're ecstatic about where you guys are with the capital campaign, that you're going to break ground pretty soon for the indoor facility. Sure, it's a, it's a huge, huge uh, facility for us. Not just the indoor complex. Um, the indoor complex is a huge part of it. Uh, it's huge from a recruiting standpoint and a functionality standpoint. Uh, but getting our offices over to the Park Avenue campus just centralizes our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, right now, we're separate. It's just not as not as linear a movement, not as functional as you'd like it to be or as efficient. So right. once we get our offices over there, we're also going to build a player's lounge, a place for our kids to eat and have study hall. I think we can centralize um, kind of our day-to-day -day operations. I'm a big believer in being around. I want to be the type of head coach that walks through study hall, that walks through uh, dinner, that that walks through the weight room. And that's difficult with our current setup. So once we get that done, I think we'll be around our kids. Maybe we'll be able to head off some things before they get to be problems because we're around a little bit more. All right, on the field last year, a lot of uh, terrific individual performers, including your quarterback, Paxton Lynch. He had a great year. How much better can he be? Well, Paxton has got a lot of room to grow. Um, and I think he's got room to grow from a physical standpoint. Uh, from a maturation standpoint, I don't mean that, that he's an immature person. I just mean uh, he's still young right. and continues to grow and handle uh, the things that come with playing that position well. Um, you know, I think he has a lot of room to continue to get better. I like the way he's approached it. Uh, he has not, you know, there haven't been days out there at practice where, where he's just kind of taking the day off and hit the coast button because there's nobody to push him that hasn't been like that now, he may have snapped into a little bit of it mm -hmm. but he snaps right out of it quickly so um i i like the way he's continuing to work we'll see how the season goes he doesn't need to press he doesn't need to try and manufacture things he just needs to continue to play within the offense continue to distribute the ball to the guys on the outside and the inside and 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 he'll have success i would imagine having depth and and options you could throw in a lot of different wrinkles yeah, I think so. You know, you can use those kids' um, skill set to, to best, you know, it, to best suit their, you know, the team and the situation. You don't want to throw things in just to say you've done it. Right. You know, and that's has to thing, make sense. That, that's the thing you got to guard against as a coach. Sometimes we want to outsmart ourselves. And you know, Jarvis Cooper is 245 pounds. Jarvis Cooper needs to be. Like we need to use him as a 245 pound tailback, right. you know. So, but Sam Kraft, on the other hand, can can do some some different things. We know what Dorland's done in between the tackles, and Jamarius has come on and had a good good camp. So, uh, we'll continue to kind of kind of move him around. And the other thing is, you know, every year that we've been here, we've had to play more than one. We've been we've gotten at some point in the season down on the depth chart to where we needed to play somebody a lot that didn't start the season off at the top. On defense, a lot has been made of the fact that you lost eight starters. You have guys waiting in the wings. How confident do you feel that guys are ready to step up and replace the Bobby McCain's, the Martin Effetti's, the Tank Jenks of the world? Well, I think that the best way to sum it up is uh, they have no problem replacing those guys in instances. It's can we can we be as consistent as those mm -hmm. guys were? You know, Bobby McCain every single day at practice in the off season brought it and uh, Terry Redden was the same way and Tank Jakes was the same way and Charles Harris was the same mm -hmm. way all those guys created a, a fantastic culture and they were so consistent and that'll be the key you know we we've got some talented guys some of them are young but can they do the right thing on a consistent basis uh, can they continue to prepare in the same way that those guys compared prepared to play a game if they can then then we'll be a consistent defense if they can't then you'll see some of the ups and downs that come with young or inexperienced teams a lot of the guys you mentioned were also some of your leaders hand-picked leaders of the team do you have guys ready i know you have your leadership council uh, or is that a big void losing as many leaders from the team that you did well certainly when you lose guys like that there's a void there mm -hmm. i mean you you've got to got to admit that but um, I think they served as great examples to the current guys, to the, the Leonard Pegueses, to the Winton McManuses, to the Jackson Dillon, uh, kind of group of guys that have tried to fill those shoes. So uh, we've tried to hold them up as examples, use them, you know, Jackson Dillon doesn't need to be anybody other than Jackson Dillon. He doesn't need to try and be Charles Harris, but 
he can use the, the way that those guys handled situations as an example, uh, as a right way to do things, as he kind of becomes a leader in his own personality. You have a familiar face in your life that's now part of the staff. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your former high school coach, Bill Blankenship, the former Tulsa head coach, and, and what role he plays now with the Tigers. Well, it's something we've talked about for a little while. Um, I didn't really think it would ever come to fruition, but, um, but fortunately it did, and uh, we're honored to have him. Uh, it's it served, served as part counselor, part scout, mm -hmm. part evaluator. Uh, he'll do some forward work on future opponents. He'll do work on current opponents. He'll uh, serve as a sounding board for position coaches and the head coach and myself. Um, you know, I just think when you have an opportunity to bring somebody with that kind of experience in that you that you know and trust and, and know that can handle those things in the right way, and you have your own staff that has their own kind of true self-confidence in themselves, that they don't feel threatened by those types of things, that you should take advantage of it. And we, we certainly have, and I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay off well for us. Justin, what are your biggest concerns for the season? Well, I, I want our guys to, to be consistent. You know, that's the biggest thing when you're, when you're young is it's a long season, and there are going to be ups and downs. I know for certain this team's going to have success. I know for certain this team is going to face adversity. And how this team handles it and how we as coaches help them handle it will determine the long-term success of this team. And when you have a group of guys that haven't been through it or, or, or haven't reacted to it before, you you got to help them through it, right. and I just want us to be a consistent. And, and you know, we have some fundamental principles that we want to adhere to throughout the season, and those those principles will be tested through the ups and downs of the year. And I want us to adhere to those, and stay the course. And at the end of the year, we'll add them up and see see how it went. I've been in Memphis since 1995, with the exception of possibly D'Angelo Williams senior year when he decided he was going to come back and hold off the NFL for a year. I've not seen the excitement about Tigers football like there is today. You've been here now going into a fourth season. Do you feel it? I mean, in this off season, have you felt it around the community that Memphis is buzzing about Tiger football? Well, I think so. You know, I, people, first of all, have been so nice to me ever since I've been here that um, they've always been respectful of, of me and my time out in the community, but also mm -hmm. been very nice. So, uh, you know, it's never reached a point of, of, uh, of being a burden. But I have. It seems like maybe it has picked up. You know, there are more people uh, that will grab you and just say thank you, or, or I'm excited for the season and that sort of stuff. And I certainly appreciate it. And you know, I try and relay that to our kids. You know, they're the ones that are living it day in and day out. That are that are putting in the work. That are that have ch that chose to come here and be a part of this program and. They deserve uh, the credit. There have been a lot of off-season, preseason, I should say, accolades for players. A lot. It seems like even more than, than normal and, and well-deserved from Paxton Lynch to Alan Cross to you name them. But there's also been a lot concerning you. A lot of publications, you know, the future of college football, coaches under a certain age or in, on every list. When you see that, what, is, what does that do for you? Not much. You know, I, I know, and I don't mean to, to denigrate anybody that puts a list together mm -hmm. or, or writes for a publication. I respect their work, but, uh, you know, for me personally, I understand the business, and I know how, uh, how fickle it is and how up and down it can be. And, um, you know, I think I've said before, it's a very short trip from the penthouse to the outhouse. Right. And, um those things are wonderful. They're nice. I think it's up to me to make sure that I serve as a great example to our kids. When I ask them to stay focused on the task at hand, to not live in the past, to to prepare for the the here and the now, uh, that I that I do that as well, and I don't worry about all the what somebody else thinks of the job that we're doing here. So uh, they're 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 nice. They're a lot better than the other publications that that could be out there. You know, the guys that sure. should be out of here, but. <laughs> Um, but in the same respect, you take all of it with a grain of salt and, and try and serve as a good example. You mentioned earlier the improvement uh, as you've gone along with your Memphis Tigers career in recruiting. Obviously, the play on the field has made a big difference, and you're 
welcomed with open arms by a lot of recruits around the country, not just in this general area. So uh, w with that said, um, you know, how can you continue this growth of Memphis Tigers football? Because obviously we have not hit a pinnacle. Oh, absolutely you can. I, you know, part of the draw to this place is, you know, show me what the ceiling is. Here. Right. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, you have a large public university in a fantastic city uh, with great support, people, a sports city. And I know it's a basketball city. I understand that. But this town loves sports and uh, will reward a job well done. And I just... I think that uh, the future is awfully bright, the opportunity for growth, what you can actually accomplish here uh, in this community. Uh, I don't think we've, we've scratched the surface of it. Now, saying that, I don't think you can just snap your fingers and get it done. You know, I think it's a process. It's going to take time. It's going to take continued, you know, between recruiting classes and retention rates and keeping guys and building, truly building a program, continuing to build facilities. But I think if you do that, I think you have a chance for something really special here. Tell me a little bit about Missouri State. You open up with tonight here at uh, Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium. Incredible challenge for us. Uh, brand new coaching staff. Uh, Dave Steckel, uh, the former defensive coordinator mm -hmm. of Missouri, uh, kind of the linchpin in that staff for many, many years and led them to two straight uh, SEC conference championships uh, or ch championship games, I should say with a fantastic defense. He's become the head coach there. Um, it's a tradition-rich program. I, we used to play him every year when I was at Illinois State. Uh, kids, some local kids on their team that are coming in to, to play. I know the kids will be sky high to play. We've got to do our job, focus on, on making sure we play well, uh, but it's certainly a, a competent opponent. Less than a minute, give me a few names of newcomers that you expect to make an impact. Well, I think uh, Jared Gentry is the first true freshman that comes to my mind that I think is going to play for us this year quite a bit. He's a nose guard from, from Alabama. Uh, he's dropped a bunch of weight throughout two-a-days and is really playing at a high level now. Hopefully, as the season goes along, we can get more plays out of him. Drew Kaiser is, was his teammate in Alabama. He plays on the offensive line. He actually graduated the semester early. He's going to play quite a bit for us. And then Jamarius Henderson, I think, will play – uh, at tailback some for us as a true freshman. Hey, Justin, always a pleasure. Best of luck to you. Have another Thank great you. season. We appreciate it. That's Tigers head coach Justin Fuente. We'll take a short time out. When we come back, it's overtime. The city of Memphis will roll out the red carpet late next month when it welcomes the USA Women's Olympic Boxing Team Trials to the Bluff City. In addition, the Men's Olympic Boxing Trials Qualifier will be staged in town. The six-day event will begin on October 25th and will culminate with the finals on Halloween night where the women's team, which will represent the Stars and Stripes in the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, will be decided. One of the boxers looking to find her way onto the team is Ginny Fush who is a native of Houston and a graduate of LSU, where she discovered the sport of boxing as a way to stay in shape. Ginny would finish fourth in the 2012 Olympic trials and feels very confident that she has what it takes to qualify for the 16 games. Recently, Ginny was in Memphis to promote the trials, and I had a chance to pick her brain. Well, Jenny, you started out at LSU, running cross-country for a while, then all of a sudden the transition to boxing. Not your natural transition. Mm -hmm. How did you get into this sport? Well, I, I only ran cross-country for LSU my freshman year, not, not very long. And then I had met someone beginning of my junior year into my sophomore year who was a boxer. And I'm a very competitive, pers a very competitive person, and I wanted to get back in shape. And I got to watch him train and win his fight. And so I was like, you know what, I, I, I think I can box. I want to, I want to try this out. To he took me to where he started as an amateur, started working with the coach there, started progressing very fast, um, started dominating in, in Louisiana. And, you know, I moved back to Houston and then looked for the uh, 2012 Olympics. Didn't make it, so I'm shooting for the 2016 Olympics. It's interesting. It's a, it's a great sport for cardiovascular. It's a great sport to stay in shape. 
when you start taking some pops to the face and you're a lovely young lady like you are, not the best, but it's something that you accepted. Uh, you've been hit. You've also dished out that type of punishment. So that was something that certainly didn't affect you when you first started to get hit for the first few times. No, my mindset was n no girl can hit me, so I'm not going to get hit. And, um, of course, you're going to you get hit in fights, but um, it's really not, you know, it really wasn't that bad. Getting hit, it didn't phase me. It didn't even, like, it just kind of blew past my head, like, oh, that was a hit. All right, you know, it's part of, I look at it as part of the sport and just, you know, it's going to happen. So it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't bug me. It doesn't happen very often either. As you get ready for the, the trials here in, in Memphis, what has been your, your progression Obviously, in July, you won, you continue to work out and get ready, but kind of give us a timetable of, of how it works for you as you gear up for October. So I pretty much go into training camp right when I get home, and um, I start off um, doing, my box, doing my boxing, you know, every six, four, five days, six to, five to six days a week, and then I do my strength training three days a week. And then September comes in, and I push up to four days a week my strength and condition coach continue the six to five to six days a week with um, my boxing hold that off in about two weeks till the trials come I start tapering down and you know the intensity throughout September is going to be high once October hits mid-October the, the intensity level starts to you know go down and I start tapering down because I'm at my peak and then the la and then the last week um, before the trials you know I just get my final sparring in um, probably do a couple sessions with my strength coach and then I get here and I'm ready you're number two in the world which is fantastic, but in this situation, you're the hunter, not the hunted. You got to beat the number one. Right. You got to beat everybody. You got to get to that point where you're number one, or you don't get to represent your country. How do you get over the hump against this number one rated boxer? Well, I'm looking to go in there and knock her out. I have to. I cannot leave it up to the judges. I fought her five times, and all the judges have given it to her, so I'm, I'm going in there and knocking her out. So, do you believe there's actually some type of preconceived notion when it comes to her because? They know the history of you two? Well, she's the reigning champ, and she's been the national champ for years. So you go in the fight, and the judges already know that. So they already have that mindset, all right, you know, what does this girl, what does this girl have over the reigning champ? Is she right. that, you know, good to beat her? So they already have that in that, in that mindset of the, theirs. So kind of, yeah, but, you know. Like I said, you know, I just got to go in there and knock her out and dominate and show the judges that, yeah, I'm better than her. Exactly. Don't leave it up to the cards. Have you given any thought to what would happen? Obviously, if you win, you representing this country, you're going to Rio in 2016, what it would mean? Oh, well, definitely changed my life. And, I mean, that's what, that's what I've been working for. That's, you know, I put my kinesiology career, which I, would I, the degree I graduated from LSU, on hold for eight years to get – to able to go to, uh, to the Olympics to represent my country. So it's just going to be the most rewarding feeling. Win or lose, representing the country or not, is this sport something you see yourself one day playing or, or fighting, I should say, professionally? Yes, I do. And, right, and, and I hope to bring the professional side of USA bo of, of women boxing to recognition to the public because right now MMA is kind of more popular and nobody really knows any good um, women boxing and I hope to change that and that's what you know that's my goal. Yeah, you brought up MMA obviously the name that people know from the women's side is, is Ronda Rousey. She's done an awful lot for the MMA game. Has she in, in some odd way done anything for just women in general in sports? Oh definitely for sure she you know she's shown everybody that you know women can you know do a sport that men typically dominate in and it's not you know that we're not that we can go in there and fight just like the men can and even though she's in the MMA game it it's helping the women boxing because a lot of women boxers are calling her out oh you can do MMA but get in the boxing ring with me and see how you do so it is helping us so that's good what would you say your 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 best uh, in the ring your your best areas your the areas that you really need to work on most well my best asset in the ring i would say is my movement my footwork and angles mm -hmm. um my my head movement is what i've been working on a lot and my inside um my inside work body body work um that's what i've been working on a lot with my coach right now uh defensively you feel like you're there yes how about as far as the um 
promotion you get from the Olympic team, uh, the fact you're in Memphis promoting this event for October. Do you feel the backing uh, from the U.S. Olympic women's boxing team? Um, yes, uh, I actually feel like um, Brian Young, who's hosting the trials, you know, he put on he put on this press conference. He's doing all the promoting himself, really, and so I I thank him for that because. Um, you say boxing, they've gone through a bunch of changes mm -hmm. with, you know, switching presidents and directors. So they're kind of disorganized. But, I mean, but, you know, they still support us and they're looking out for us. So, but I definitely have to give Brian Young um, a lot of credit for what he's doing for us for this Olympic trials. Jimmy, it's great to have you in Memphis. Looking forward to watching your fight here in Memphis in October. Thank you. Looking forward to it. And best of luck to Ginny. Finally tonight, a big setback for Grizzlies rookie Jarrell Martin, who sustained a fractured left foot earlier this week after colliding with a fellow player during a workout. Martin underwent surgery on Thursday. There is no timetable for his return. And that'll do it for now. Remember, you can see any of our past shows by heading to our website, WKNO.org, or checking us out on YouTube. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.